listening to bostonfreeradio.com. Hello, you are listening to the show Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio, WBCA, or on Somerville Community Access TV, which is airing the show live. As I might have said before, I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm going to review three new movies for you, as well as give you a synopsis of the Comic-Con that I was at this past weekend. But first, I'm going to get into my usual segment, What's Topping the Box Office? This is a recap of the top ten highest-grossing films of this past weekend. And it should come as no surprise to anyone that the number one movie last week is the number one movie this week, Thor Ragnarok, which is still getting great reviews and... Apparently, bringing in a lot of cash as well. So, Thor Ragnarok earned $57.1 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $180 million, the movie grossed $212.1 million so far in the United States. And around the world, it has grossed $650.1 million. I can't even say dollars right. Which means that Thor Ragnarok is a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is most certainly a certified hit. The number one highest grossing debut movie of the week is the number two highest grossing movie of the week, which is Daddy's Home 2, the sequel to the 2015 hit movie starring Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg. That's one of the movies I'll be reviewing for you later in the show, so I'll just keep mum about what I thought about it. But this weekend, Daddy's Home 2 made $29.7 million at the U.S. box office, and that's against a budget of $69 million. So Daddy's Home 2 is not a hit yet here in the States, and I don't have any information on how it did around the world, but I can tell you that it still has a ways to go to recoup its budget. Murder on the Orient Express did not do as well as Daddy's Home 2, but it still did an impressive amount in its first week in theaters this weekend it earned 28.7 million dollars against a budget of 55 million dollars now it is kind of surprising to me that murder on the orient express made or actually cost less to make than daddy's home 2 but then again daddy's home 2 actually had a few more special effects but I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. But Murder on the Orient Express has so far made $85.4 million at the international box office, which makes it not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is a tentative hit and should be a certified hit by next week. A Bad Mom's Christmas is number four at the box office this weekend, falling from number two last week. This weekend, A Bad Mom's Christmas earned $11.5 million. Against a budget of $28 million, A Bad Mom's Christmas has so far made $39.8 million at the U.S. box office so far in its two weeks in release, and it has made $46.5 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world, which is actually a very good start for this movie. Jigsaw, despite it not being Halloween, is still hanging in there at number five at the box office, where it fell from number three last week, having earned $3.4 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $10 million, though, Jigsaw has earned $34.4 million at the U.S. box office and $79.1 million around the world. So even though it's not Halloween anymore, and even though I thought people were sick of the Saw movies, it turns out they are not, as Jigsaw is a certified hit here in the States and around the world, and you will undoubtedly see another Saw movie. It, Whether or not you that's good news to you, well, I guess... <laughs> I'm just moving on. Tyler Perry's Boo 2 and Medea Halloween is also pulling in, unfortunately, very impressive numbers in its fourth week in release. This week, it grossed $2 million. Against a budget of $25 million, though, Boo 2 and Medea Halloween has grossed $45.9 million in the U.S. box office and $46.7 million around the world, thereby making a bulk of its money in the United States which is crazy, but Tyler Perry's Boo 2 and Medea Halloween has made a profit, but it is a tentative hit right now. It could be a certified hit by next week. We will just have to wait and see. Geostorm is a movie that is struggling at the box office, but it is in its fourth week in release. However, it hasn't pulled in nearly the numbers that Boo 2 has pulled. Geostorm 
made $1.6 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $120 million, Geostorm has so far made $31.7 million at the U.S. box office, which means it's not even close to a hit and is likely to be considered a bomb in the U.S. However, around the world it has made $199 million even, which means that Geostorm is not a hit yet here in the States and probably never will be, but around the world it is a certified hit. Blade Runner 2049 is a movie that's also struggling, although not struggling as much as Geostorm, because at least Blade Runner 2049 has good reviews on its side. This week, though, Blade Runner 2049 has made $1.5 million at the box office in its sixth week in release. Against a budget of $150 million, Blade Runner 2049 has so far made $88.1 million at the U.S. box office and a staggering $243 million worldwide, making it a not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world, it is a tentative hit. So it's doing decently, just probably not as well as studios had hoped. Happy Death Day is number nine at the box office this weekend, sliding from number six last week. And this is probably faltering because the Halloween season is over and people probably don't want to see this movie after Halloween or at least leading into Thanksgiving, but it's still doing relatively well. Happy Death Day earned $1.3 million at the box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $4.8 million, Happy Death Day has so far made $54.9 million at the U.S. box office and $88.2 million worldwide, which means it is a certified hit here in the States or and around the world. So whether you love this movie or you hated it, it is still undoubtedly a certified hit. And finally, the newest entry to the top 10 list is Lady Bird, if you don't count Daddy's Home or Murder on the Orient Express, because Lady Bird has been released into theaters limitedly. And this weekend, it earned $1.2 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $10 million, Lady Bird has so far earned $1.7 million in the United States and $1.8 million worldwide, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world, but good reviews and maybe a little bit more expansion may help Lady Bird, but it certainly won't pull, pull in the numbers that Thor Ragnarok has pulled in, but we didn't expect that either. Listen, as a hiring manager, I've got to tell you, the best job candidate isn't always the typical candidate. Sometimes they're a grad of life. Meet the grads of life. Young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. Sometimes the best candidates aren't the ones you're used to. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Hi, I'm Pierce. And I'm Calvin. And are you tired of fake news? Yes. So tired. Sorry, were you asking me? I was just in general. Oh, well, I, yeah, yeah. I am I can only speak for me. I'm really tired of so, fake news. Yeah, me too. So, good thing is we run a oh, that's right. radio we, show. Right, we have a radio show where we uh, try to debunk fake news. We try to cut through all the all the oh, crap. Crap. Yeah. Because there's a lot of it. Uh-huh. And we're trying to bring you f- straight facts. Straight facts. Oh, it's called Fact Up. It's Our show's called Fact Up. It's not called Straight Facts. facts. No. The show is called Fact up. up. And it's Mondays at 2 p.m. And it's an hour long. Yeah, only on BFR. <clears throat> Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Daddy's Home 2, which is the sequel to Daddy's Home, which came out two years ago. Although that Daddy's Home came out a little while after Christmas, whereas Daddy's Home 2, which ironically is set during the holiday season, came out before Thanksgiving. But I don't have a problem with it because Daddy's Home 2, just a little bit of a spoiler alert, is actually a much better movie than Daddy's Home. Daddy's Home was pretty good. It has it had its laugh, but it was also full of movie cliches and some unnecessary slapstick. Daddy's Home 2, fortunately, is a little bit less predictable, and also the slapstick, especially from Will Ferrell, is very well-timed. And also, you have some great supporting performances by the likes of John Lithgow and Mel Gibson. But before I get into how each and every actor did, let me just give you a little bit of a synopsis of the movie. 
So this movie it leaves leaves us basically or brings us to where B- Brad and Dusty, who are Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg's character res- respectively, left us in Daddy's Home. So unlike the beginning of Daddy's Home, Brad and Dusty, again, Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg respectively, are co-step-parents who get along pretty well, (laughs) definitely unlike the bulk of the last movie. However, as the holiday season approaches, they must deal with their intrusive fathers as as the whole family goes on a trip together and spends one Christmas together. So... Dusty, Mark Wahlberg's character, has a very dysfunctional relationship with his father, Kurt, who's played in this movie by Mel Gibson. In other words, Kurt has been very distant from Dusty their entire lives. And if you know Mark Wahlberg's character, it's probably no wonder that that is. However, Brad has a much, uh, Will Ferrell's character has a much more functional relationship with his father, Don, who's played by John Lithgow. And I got to tell you, the scenes between Will Ferrell and John Lithgow, who both of whom have never been in a movie before this, as far as I could tell, are purely comic gold, just the way they embrace each other. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what kind of interactions the two of them have, but if I do tell you that, that will just ruin the surprise. But even still, the two fathers get on the two stepdads' nerves as the holiday season is quickly approaching, and both of them, or rather their whole family, actually rents a cabin through Airbnb and spends the holidays there. In addition to that, Mark Wahlberg's character has to deal with his precocious and rebellious stepdaughter, Adriana, who's played in this movie by Dee Dee Costine, because Mark Wahlberg's character is married to Karen, who's this Brazilian beauty, played by real-life Victoria's Secret model Alex- Alessandra Ambrosio, who is previously married to a man named Roger, who's played briefly in this movie, as he was in the last film, by John Cena. So there is a lot to love about Daddy's Home 2. The reason I liked it a lot better than the original Daddy's Home is not only because of the comic timing of John Lithgow and Mel Gibson, and the way they react both realistically and poignantly with their respective sons, That's all well and good, but I also thought that the original Daddy's Home had a lot of very forced slapstick, and there was one unnecessary scene where Will Ferrell got really drunk in an attempt to impress his stepchildren over their real father, played by Mark Wahlberg, and I didn't think that was necessary for that movie. I also thought the scene where he had a fake Christmas for his kids was a little too forced. But I did like Daddy's Home 2 actually not only a lot better than the first one, but I liked it a lot better than the recent movie A Bad Mom's Christmas, only because Daddy's Home, the original one for 2015, was a decent movie. I gave it my rating of a checkout when I first reviewed it, whereas A Bad Mom's Christmas followed Bad Moms, which I thought was even more forced and even less funny. So I think that Daddy's Home 2 has a lot more to live up to, but fortunately, not only did it live up to the hype of the original Daddy's Home, it also fortunately exceeded it. And I loved all the characters in the movie. Of course, I I spoke wonders of Will Ferrell, Mark Wahlberg, Mel Gibson, and John Lithgow. And I do have to say, Mel Gibson plays the more jaded person in this movie. And I think the days of Mel Gibson going back to his leading man role where he played a genuinely nice and well-meaning guy, those days are over and probably all for the best. However, I do have to say that Mel Gibson still shows in this movie that A, he can act, and B, he can actually be funny. And that's that's probably a lot to be said, especially considering that some of the comedies he's done, particularly ones like What Women Want, have not aged particularly well. But I do think that Daddy's Home 2 will age well. But I also liked some of the supporting performances by the likes of Linda Cardellini as Sarah, who is Dusty's ex-wife and who is Brad's current wife. And I liked how... She was probably the more grounded character in this movie. Unfortunately, she wasn't brushed to the side as much. And also, unlike the Bad Moms movies, I also thought that 
the kids in this movie had very good grounded and round personalities. In other words, they weren't just cardboard characters like they were in the Bad Moms movies. So you had Dylan, who's played by Owen Vaccaro, who has a realistic crush on a girl who's in the town where he's staying for the holidays. You also have the precocious Megan, who's played by Scarlett Estevez. Whether or not she's related to the Estevez slash Sheen family, I don't know. But either way, she had some funny scenes in this movie. I thought the interactions between her and Adriana in this movie were funny and also grounded the movie to a point of necessary realism. So there's a lot to love about Daddy's Home 2. I laughed a lot during this movie, a lot more than I did during the original Daddy's Home, and I didn't think there were as many contrivances in this film. It felt real, it felt natural, and probably best of all, it felt funny. Daddy's Home 2 gets my rating of an absolute knockout. I think it's one of the funniest holiday movies I've seen in a very long time. Fortunately, it has exceeded the hype of Daddy's Home, and I can guarantee you it is a lot funnier than A Bad Mom Christmas, which you might remember last week as a movie to which I gave my rating of a checkout. So it was a pleasant surprise, but Daddy's Home 2 is fortunately much funnier than A Bad Mom's Christmas, and I think you'll enjoy it. It only takes a minute to find out if you may have prediabetes, and you can do it at doihaveprediabetes.org. But you're probably not going to, are you? Kids, work, listening to the radio, you're busy. Which is great, because busy people can't get prediabetes. Oh my, I read that wrong. <laughs> they can. Should have worn my glasses. So visit doihaveprediabetes.org and take a short test, because prediabetes can be reversed. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its prediabetes awareness partners. Are you ready to get your geek on? Then join me, Tikva, for Geek Love, music for geeks, weirdos, and the psychologically tilted, right here on Boston Free Radio, Saturdays, 2 to 4 p.m. See you there. Hey, everybody, this is Sleaze Grinder, host of the Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party, the most dangerous show on television. And if your eyes are tired, guess what? Now you can listen to it. The Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party is now on Boston Free Radio, Sundays at 7 p.m., right here. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are currently listening on Boston Free Radio, on WBCA, or you are watching it on Somerville Community Access TV or some Community Access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them, I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal Facebook page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Murder on the Orient Express, which, according to my research, is the fifth film, but the fourth theatrically released film that has been released based on the novel written by Agatha Christie, which she wrote in 1934 under the title of Murder in the Calais Coach by Dodd, Mead, and Company, or at least that was the publishing company that brought that book out. But anyway, Murder on the Orient... Blah, 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 Mort- Murder on the Orient Express is brought to us by director Kenneth Branagh, who also stars in the movie as Hercule Perrault, who, for those of you who are who are familiar with Agatha Christie's body of work, is a recurring ca- character in the Agatha Christie universe. So Kenneth Branagh dons an even bigger mustache than Poirot has donned in the several movies and TV shows in which he has been a prominent character. But... Poirot still has the instincts and the acumen of other such astute detectives as Sherlock Holmes and the like. So anyway, Hercule Poirot is investigating, as as the name of the movie suggests, a murder on the Orient Express. And there are several major characters in the film, including... A Spanish woman named Pilar Estravados, who's played by Benelope Cruz. There's also a doctor, 
Dr. Arbuthnot, I guess he wasn't given a first name in this movie, who's played by Leslie Odom Jr. And Leslie Odom Jr. is an African-American actor in a part that is not designated or wasn't originally written for a black character. But the fact that he is black and the fact that this movie takes place in the 30s is not ignored. This is actually taking place in the winter of 1934. And there are other characters such as Willem Dafoe, who plays Gerhard Hardman, Judy Dench, who plays Princess Dragomiroff, Johnny Depp as a man by the name of Samuel Ratchet, Josh Gad as Samuel Ratchet's assistant, Hector McQueen, who is a lawyer by trade, but a personal assistant to Mr. Ratchet. There's also Derek Jacoby as Edward Henry Masterman, Michelle Pfeiffer as Carolyn Hubbard, Daisy Ridley as Mary Debenham, and I could go on, but I'm just basically reading a bunch of names, which is part of the problem of this movie. Of course, Kenneth Branagh is a very skilled actor and a, and a skilled director as well. In fact, you could probably credit him for bringing Shakespeare popularity to the United States, especially with a number of very astute and auspicious Shakespeare film adaptations, including but not limited to Henry V, which was from the early 90s, what year I, I can't quite pinpoint for you. He also brought us an Americanized version of Much Ado About Nothing, which starred him, Emma Thompson, Denzel Washington, Keanu Reeves, and Kate Beckinsale, when she wasn't quite as well known. And he also brought us a very auspicious version of Hamlet from 1996, which brought us, which starred a number of people you wouldn't have expected to be in a production of Hamlet, including, but not limited to, Robin Williams and Billy Crystal. So we've also seen Kenneth Branagh adapt films or rather stories that we wouldn't have expected to be really good films including his his most recent project before this which was a disney remake of cinderella and as i've said before disney has kind of gone a little overboard and is continuing to go overboard with their remakes but their version of cinderella was actually pretty good so about this film murder on the orient express this is coming from somebody who has not read the book by agatha christie or has not seen any films or film adaptations of this story. So I can't exactly say how it compares to the other films, but I thought Poirot, portrayed by Branagh, was probably the most intriguing character. But unfortunately, even though you have a lot of great actors portraying potentially intriguing characters, I think there were just way too many actors for a one-hour and 55-minute movie to really focus on each and every one of them. And you, you have great actors like Johnny Depp, Judy Dench, Josh Gad, and the list goes on, who could potentially play interesting characters, but once you actually get to know them, it's really all talk and no showing. And again... Obviously, the story of Murder on the Orange Express must have been dialogue-driven, but film is a visual medium, which means that you, you really should not have a lot of characters talking, and you should do a lot more showing, at least from my perspective. And instead, Murder on the Orange Express felt a lot duller than it probably should have been. I thought it would be a, at least a little bit more enticing. It's, it's, after all, a story about a murder. And the conclusion of the film, when the murder or, or when the murderer or murderers, I won't reveal which, become revealed, it feels a little bit like a cop-out. And the way that Poirot deals with these murderers is also very quizzical and it seems to me unrealistic not to mention particularly not very intriguing however the movie looked very good i thought the actors did what they could with the film so it gets my rating of a checkout it's a movie that comes as a bit of a disappointment but it's overall not a bad film i did think kenneth branagh shined as poirot but i think that was also part of the problem of murder on the orient express it was a lot of focus on poirot but not enough focus on the victim as well as the potential murderers 
there could have been a lot more emphasis on the variety of characters. And you could definitely tell that the actors were doing what they could with what they were given. The problem was they weren't given a lot. And I think maybe this movie would have had a chance to be a a little bit better if Kenneth Branagh had chosen to be either director or lead actor, but definitely not both. You're neutral to it, and you can hear it repeatedly without feeling anything. But when we introduce a new stimulus, save the food, we've achieved pulling a natural or inborn response from you. Save the food, because 40% of all food in the U.S. never gets eaten. Save the food, cook it, store it, share it, just don't waste it. For tips and recipes, visit savethefood.com, brought to you by NRDC and the Ad Council. My name is Miss Nelson. My name is Bruce. And we've made a wild and wonderful record for you. We will tell you all kinds of things to do and be, and you can let your imagination go with us. Just listen to what we say, dear hearts. This is where the magic starts. Radioscopia, Fridays, 5 to 7 p.m., only on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Last Flag Flying. This is the latest from director Richard Linklater with a screenplay by Linklater and Daryl Ponixan based upon actually the 2005 novel of the same name by the the author Daryl Ponixan, who actually wrote that book as a sequel to his 1970 novel, The Last Detail, which was made into a movie in 1973 of the same name, starring Jack Nicholson and Randy Quaid. So even though Last Flag Flying, the novel, was a sequel to The Last Detail, this film adaptation is an unofficial sequel to the 1973 film. In other words, the movie deals with three Vietnam veterans, but not characters with the same names but either way I, I suppose jack nicholson could have been in this movie but jack nicholson is actually retired from acting randy quaid is well in hiding somewhere in canada and the other actor who was in the last detail otis young actually passed away unfortunately in 2001 so we have a new cast here and a new care and new characters but all of whom were Marines during the Vietnam War. There is Larry Doc Shepard, who's played in this movie by Steve Carell, as a grieving Vietnam veteran whose son actually went off to fight in the Iraq War and was unfortunately killed in battle right before the capture of Saddam Hussein. This movie takes place, by the way, in December of 2003. So this is when the Iraq War is going on, but it just it details the point up to when Saddam Hussein was captured. You also have Sal Nealon, who's played in this movie by Brian Cranston, and you also have a fellow Vietnam veteran, Richard Mueller, who's now Reverend Richard Mueller, who's played by Lawrence Fishburne. So the three Vietnam veterans who were in the same platoon together and fought alongside each other, and also have a sordid past when it comes to when it came to fighting in the Vietnam War, come together to identify the body of Steve Carell's son, who, as I said, was was killed in Iraq, and get him to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is where Larry Doc Shepard resided in order to be buried. So last flag, excuse me, last flag flying, forget I said that, last flag flying is a road trip movie, but it's also a poignant movie about aging Vietnam War veterans and also not only how they're dealing with being Vietnam War veterans during the height of a very controversial war, but also one of the veterans dealing with the grief and the death of his own son. And all three of the actors, Steve Carell, Brian Cranston, and Lawrence Fishburne, turn in great performances, with probably Steve Carell and Brian Cranston turning in their best performances on film to date. Lawrence Fishburne has also had some great performances on film, including but not limited to Apocalypse Now, Boys in the Hood, What's Love Got to Do With It? But 
I wouldn't say this is his best work, but is still really good. I'm saying that apologetically, but this movie definitely has a lot of ground to cover emotionally and also in terms of revealing who the characters actually are. But I think all three of the characters, actors do incredibly well. Steve Carell is the one who's a little bit more quiet and has his moments of grieving. Sal Nealon, Brian Cranston's character, is definitely more of the cut-up, the one who is cracking jokes and also is a little bit more jaded about his experiences in Vietnam, whereas Richard Mueller is more... Lawrence Fishburne's character is more of the grounded one, or at least more of the moral compass. So Brian Cranston would be more of the id. Steve Carell would be probably the ego and Lawrence Fishburne would be the super ego. If that makes sense, if you study psychology like I have. So the movie takes them from Virginia, where we first meet Steve Carell and Brian Cranston's character to Washington, D.C., to New York, and then eventually to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, without giving anything away. And there are a lot of sad moments in this movie, particularly coming from Steve Carell. And of course, we've seen from Steve Carell's earlier films like Little Miss Sunshine and Foxcatcher that... Steve Carell is a great dramatic actor, even though we hadn't seen we, we see him more in comedies like The 40 Year Old Virgin and Date Night than we see him in dramas, but he is an equally fine dramatic actor as well as comedic actor, and he's having a great year, not to met with Last Flag Flying as well as his previous turn in Battle of the Sexes, which came out earlier this year, and got really great reviews, including from yours truly. So you not only see these three veterans dealing with the death of one of their sons, but you also see them dealing with another shady incident where one of their fellow Marines died while in the presence of these three. And the movie doesn't delve into too much detail about what the three of them did or what role they played in this fellow Marine's death. But eventually there is a heart-tugging scene where they visit the the dead Marine's mother, who's only known here as Mrs. Hightower, who's played in a effective but brief cameo by Cicely Tyson. And this is when the three of them actually go to Boston to visit Ms. Hightower. And it's a really difficult scene. It actually reminded me of the scene in Born on the Fourth of July where Ron Kovic, who's played by Tom Cruise, actually goes to visit the family of the fellow Marine whom he accidentally killed. And apparently that scene did not happen in real life, in Ron Kovic's life. But when you watch the scene in that movie, Born on the Fourth of July, it's it's really difficult, as it probably would be a very difficult thing to witness or even be a part of let alone to see on screen so last flag flying is one of the best movies i've seen so far this year i can't say for sure whether or not it'll be in the top 10 but i do hope the academy recognizes at least steve carell and brian cranston and maybe lawrence fishburne but i do think that steve carell has a pretty good chance of being nominated for best actor and brian cranston is best supporting actor and last flag flying gets my rating of a knockout it is certainly another win for richard linkladder who's directed some great films over the last three years They'll challenge your authority because that's what kids do. But this car is your territory, and in here, your word is law. So when you say you won't move until everyone's buckled up, you won't budge an inch until you hear that click. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. For more information, visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. From the hub of the solar system to the world, bostonfreeradio.com. Hi, listen to me, Ed Robleski, every Wednesday from 5 to 7 for Talking Hendrix, where we will celebrate the music and legacy of Jimi Hendrix's career and much more. 
tune in every Wednesday from 5 to 7 and here on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on WBCA on Boston Free Radio, or you are watching on Somerville Community Access TV or some community access television station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them, I say thank you. Or you are watching me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Facebook, or rather, Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So, for those of you who are regular listeners on this show, you probably know that I review at least three movies a week and as many as five movies a week. Well, I only reviewed three this week, not because not enough films came out. I think I, I probably could have seen four movies if I had time, but the point I'm trying to get at right now is actually I didn't have time because I attended Rhode Island Comic Con this year, which I attended last year, but this time I was not a paying VIP member. This time I was a member of the press, and going into Rhode Island Comic Con, I wanted to give you just a a glimpse of some of the things that I witnessed, the panels in which I took part or at least witnessed and just give you a general sense of what it was like at Rhode Island Comic Con without boring you to tears. Well, Rhode Island Comic Con, in short, was a lot of fun this year. And being a member of the press, I got a lot of access, but not so much access that I was able to get one-on-one interviews. But I did actually sit down on a number of very intriguing panels and got to listen to some behind-the-scenes stories of some movies that were featured. And one of the very first panels in which I sat was... When Broken Lizards, Paul Soder, and Eric Stolhansky came by and actually discussed a number of their Broken Lizard movies, including probably the movie that got the bulk of the attention, Super Troopers. And Super Troopers is the breakout film for the Broken Lizard comedy sextet and they have since starred in and directed a number of other films since then but super troopers is the one that put them on the map it was screened at sundance it came out in 2001 it wasn't a particularly big hit but then when it came out on video and dvd because remember this was 2002 so people more people had vcrs than the dvd players but once that came out on video it became a gradual cult classic And probably all for the best, because Broken Lizards had some movies that have failed, like Slam and Salmon, but they've also had movies that have been actually pretty big, pretty funny movies, like Beer Fest and Club Dread, both of which I liked. But it was was great to hear some behind-the-scenes stories from Eric Stolhansky and Paul Soder. I got to learn some funny behind-the-scenes stories, as well as getting a little bit of a preview of a movie that's coming out soon, although I didn't get to see a movie trailer, and even if I did, I probably would just shut my eyes and and plug my ears. But Super Troopers 2 is actually slated to come out, date subject to change, on April 20th, 2018. So, J.H. Chandrasekhar is back as director and writer, and the other... Five members of Super Troopers are coming back to write and star in the movie. And some other people who were supporting characters in that film, such as Brian Cox and Linda Carter, are coming back to reprise their roles from the original movie. So there is a little bit of a risk for Super Troopers 2 to come out 17 years after the original. And... Of course, I'm not opposed to sequels if they're good, but again, they're probably, I think, judging from the conversation that I I witnessed with those two actors who are, I just temporarily for... I'm going to edit this part out of the pre-recorded broadcast, but judging from the 
talk I witnessed with Mr. Stolhansky and Mr. Soder, I think they're pretty much aware of the symptoms of sequelitis, and they are probably not going to make the same mistake again. But I also went to a lot of panels with some of the supporting members of Beverly Hills Cop, including Judge Reinhold and John Asher, who played the cops who were supervising Eddie Murphy's Axel Foley as he was going around Beverly Hills and making sure he didn't interfere with a certain case, even though he insisted that he was on vacation. So to hear some behind-the-scenes stories of all three Beverly Hills Cop movies was pretty intriguing by them. I'm not, I, I'm not exactly sure what to divulge, but I also went to a panel which was which involved Christopher Lloyd and Tom Wilson, who played Emmett Doc Brown and Biff Tannen in all three Back to the Future movies. And I got to tell you, man, seeing Christopher Lloyd and Tom Wilson on the stage talking about their various Back to the Future stories, including delving into a little bit of Back to the Future, the ride and sort of the making of that ride as well as their experiences actually being on the ride was pretty funny as as a matter of fact i don't know how many people have been to either universal studios in florida or universal studios in hollywood and have actually ridden back to the future of the ride it is a very fun ride but interestingly enough tom wilson stars in the ride as biff tannen and there's this whole plot of him basically carjacking the DeLorean and going through time. And it was fascinating to hear about the making of this ride, as well as the things that the set designers had to do to make Hill Valley and other sets in this ride, in this virtual reality ride, look realistic. But I also found out that Tom Wilson actually gets motion sick when he goes in that DeLorean ride. And I found that very ironic as well as hilarious. In fact, I'm laughing about it right now. In fact, he revealed an anecdote about him going on the ride for the first time and getting kind of seasick or rather motion sick, kind of like seasickness. And then he gets off the ride and uh, uh, some parents come up to him and say, you know, it would be great if you went on this ride with Jimmy. He would love to get on this ride with you and tom wilson just says all right jimmy come along (laughs) i felt so bad for the guy but it was it was really great being at rhode island comic-con and hearing all these stories about movies of course there's everything for fans at comic-con regarding comics tv shows but i went for the movies and i'm really glad i did and i probably will next year too josh groban My favorite thing about music is its ability to inspire and nourish the soul. That's why I'm proud to work with Feeding America, an organization that inspires hope for families in need and helps nourish the 16 million kids in this country struggling with hunger. The Feeding America nationwide network of food banks gathers surplus food and helps get it to kids in need, but they can't do it alone. Find out how you can help at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. I love those real sick sons They're the ones that move me A thinly blow Neurotic tone Intensify and groove me all this and more on Unpopular Music, Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed all the movies that I'm going to review for the show and give you a, given you a little taste of what I experienced at Rhode Island Comic Con, it's now time for me to get into my last segment a little bit early this time. This time I will take up two segments instead of my usual one. And that segment is What's Coming Out Next. This is a spoken word preview on the movies that are coming out this coming weekend and whether or not I'm going to see these movies movies and i will be absolutely clear to you what movies i'm going to see what movies i plan to see and what movies i will skip and there aren't many i I, i'll skip but i usually skip sequels of movies that i haven't seen the originals 
you know, for instance, if I didn't see Bad Moms, I probably wouldn't have seen a Bad Moms Christmas. And if I hadn't seen Daddy's Home, I wouldn't see Daddy's Home 2. But it's a good thing I saw both those films because the sequels to both of those were better than I expected in both cases, with Daddy's Home 2 being the best movie of the two sequels. But anyway, here's what's coming out the week end of November 17th. So coming out November 17th, and probably coming out in previews before this, is the somewhat warmly anticipated Justice League. I don't want to say it's hotly anticipated because... Man of Steel and Batman vs. Superman, not to mention Justice League, were all commercial hits but critical disappointments. So there's not a lot going for Justice League except for the fact that Gal Gadot is reprising her role as Wonder Woman. And not only was she the best thing about Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice, but the Wonder Woman movie was so good, it made everyone pretty much forget about the disappointments that were the other DC Universe movies. But anyway, with Justice League, which, as I said, is warmly anticipated, fueled by his restored faith in humanity and inspired by Superman's selfless act, Bruce Wayne enlists the help of his newfound ally, Diana Prince, that is Wonder Woman, to face an even greater enemy. What that enemy is, I don't know, but I can tell you that Ben Affleck is Batman in this film. Um, Gal Gadot, as I said, returns as Wonder Woman. There's also Jason Moma as Aquaman. And I want to say he reprises his role, but we only really get a brief glimpse of Aquaman in the Batman vs. Superman movie. But there's also Ezra Miller making his debut as The Flash. And there's also Cyborg, who I don't know who actually plays Cyborg just from the list that I'm given because I'm given a long list of actors from the previous films that are going to reprise their roles. But either way, DC is going to give Justice League their best shot. This is a movie I will see. I can't say whether it's going to be great or not. I really don't know. Judging from the fact that Ben Affleck is returning as Batman, it might not be great. But judging from the fact that Gal Gadot is reprising her role as Wonder Woman, it might actually be good. But I will see it. I'll review it for you on next week's show. And that's all there is to it. Another movie that's coming out is a movie called Wonder. Now, Wonder is actually based on a young adult novel that I didn't actually think was written or was going to be adequately made for the screen, but it is based on an, a young adult novel written by R.J. Palacio, and it stars Jacob Tremblay as Augie, and it tells the incredible, inspi- inspiring, and heartwarming story of August Pullman, a boy with facial differences who enters fifth grade attending a mainstream elementary school for the first time. So Wonder is based on an original story, which I believe is fiction, but its theme is not in is something that has been done before, particularly in the movie Mask, starring Eric Schultz and Cher, which is a really great movie if you want to check that movie out. But Wonder also stars Julia Roberts and Owen Wilson. And I'd be interested to see how this movie is, although I really want to read the book first. And considering that's a young adult novel, I could probably sit down and bang that novel out in a day. But I will see this movie sometime this weekend, hopefully after reading the book, and I will let you know what I think when I see it on next week's show. Another movie that's coming out is a CGI animated movie that my guess is going to be crushed next week by Disney Pixar's Coco, but the movie is The Star. And it's a movie about a small but brave donkey and his animal friends who become the unsung heroes of the first Christmas. So is this a Jesus Freak movie? Uh, Yes and no. I, I would say yes because it is a story about the first Christmas and about the baby Jesus. But no because it actually has a star studded cast that includes Keegan Michael Key, Kristen Chenoweth, Zachary Levy, Christopher Plummer, Mariah Carey, playing the voice of a hen if you can believe it, Tyler Perry, and Oprah Winfrey, all playing various barnyard animals. And this is a movie that's actually from the Jim Henson Company. And the Jim Henson, or rather the Jim Henson Company, has come out with 
animated films in the past and i yes i do actually mean animated films not muppet films because actually up until jim henson died he was actually very fascinated with cgi animation and actually wanted to partake in that himself unfortunately he died before he got the chance but he would have been if he were alive today he would be very interested in the disney pixar films but the difference between the star and the other movies that the Jim Henson Company has come out with is the fact that the star is the very first animated feature from the Jim Henson Company to be released in theaters. The other CGI animated movies that the Jim Henson, Henson Company have done has come have come out on DVD, and I haven't seen any of those. Or they've come direct to video or direct to streaming. I can't say whether or not those films are actually good, but the fact that the star has come out in theaters probably is a good indication that the film might be good. But again, I can't say whether or not this film is good because I haven't seen it. The only way I can tell you if it's good is if I've seen it and if I'd be willing to divulge information on it. And you will hear me divulge information on it on next week's Words on Film, which is actually the first words on film or the last words on film before thanksgiving so i'll come back right next tuesday before thanksgiving and i'll tell you exactly what i think about justice league wonder and the star as well as a number of films that i haven't gotten around to seeing that are out in theaters now but which i will see by next week up next we have nico Nico is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right. A group known especially for their sunspot sleeping, ball chasing, leg rubbing, and of course, companionship. Just look how she struts. It's like she owns the place. And see how she curls up and cuddles her person. The pitch on her purring is simply perfect. Nice one. Fantastic cat. But really the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Nico is to meet one. Visit the shelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm continuing with my segment of what's coming out next. The other films that are coming out next are, or rather this coming weekend, are films that are going to be in limited release. But man, there's one here that I'm going to introduce you to that I really hope is going to be in theaters or at least in a theater near me, so I can divulge on it next week. The movie is Roman J. Israel, Esquire. Now, this is a crime drama that stars Denzel Washington as the titular character, who is a driven, idealistic defense attorney who, through a tumultuous series of events, finds himself in a crisis that leads to extreme action. The movie co-stars Colin Farrell, Carmen Ijogo, and Linda Gravatt. And this is a movie that is rated PG-13, but looks like an interesting courtroom drama. Again, I can't say whether or not this movie is going to be good. The fact that it has Denzel Washington in it is certainly very promising. And this movie was probably right to come out around Oscar season. And maybe Denzel Washington has another chance to win another Best Actor Oscar. Again, too soon to tell. But... I will see this movie if it's coming out in a theater near me, if, and I will let you know what I think next week. There's another movie that might not be coming to a theater near me, but it looks interesting enough. The movie is called Mudbound. Mudbound is about two men who return home from World War II to work on a farm in rural Mississippi where they struggle to deal with racism and adjusting to life after the war. And the two men, whom the description didn't mention, are naturally african-american men the movie stars uh, actually carrie mulligan garrett headland jason clark and jonathan banks the latter of whom is best known for playing big mike on breaking bad and its spinoff better call saul i believe the the two men in question in this movie are 
Jason Mitchell, who plays Ronsell Jackson. And there is one other actor, but... Oh, actually, it's Rob Morgan, another African-American actor who plays Hap Jackson. So I'm not sure if the movie is about two African-American men, why they're not listed first in the credits. But I guess with Carey Mulligan and Garrett Hedlund being better-known actors, they're mentioned first because they're the better-known actors. At least I hope that's the case. I, I really hope it wasn't racism that had to do with that. But Mudbound definitely sounds like an interesting movie. I can't say whether it looks like an interesting movie because I don't watch movie previews, but I will seek out this movie. Can't guarantee whether I see it or not, but it certainly looks very interesting. And with a star-studded cast like this, and an- another actress who I didn't mention, Mary J. Blige in the movie, I would love to see it, but again, I can't guarantee whether or not I will. But another movie that's coming out this coming weekend is a documentary called Big Sonia. And again, this is a documentary, not a dramatization. But this is a movie that takes place in the last store in a defunct shopping mall where 91-year-old Sonia Warshawski, who is a great-grandmother, businesswoman, and Holocaust survivor, runs the tailor shop she's owned for more than 30 years. But when she served an eviction notice, the specter of retirement prompts Sonia who, amazing, she still works at 91, to revisit her harrowing past as a refugee and witness to genocide. This is a poignant story of generational trauma and healing, and it also offers a laugh-out-loud funny portrait of the power of love to triumph over bigotry and the power of truth-telling to heal us all. Man, I don't know if that documentary is opening up in theaters near me, but damn it if that sounds like a very intriguing premise. So Sonia Warshawski is a real-life woman, 91-year-old woman who does work in a real tailor shop in a defunct shopping mall. And it's interesting how certain shopping malls are running out of business, and that alone would be a very intriguing subject for a documentary but then you then again you have a holocaust survivor who was able to immigrate to the united states open up her own business and thrive for a a period of time that's really admirable so the movie is called big sonia if it's opening up in a theater near you i recommend you check it out and if you are watching this and you have seen it and you want to tell me how it is next week definitely leave a comment in my facebook page And other than that, the other movies that are coming out, there are several movies that are coming out in re-release, in limited release, one that is opening in Los Angeles, Ah, one of the disadvantages to being in Boston, but one of the only disadvantages. I wish when they said limited release, it always meant Boston, but you probably think that for your hometown as well. But anyway, that does it with Words on Film for this week. Just a reminder that Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and the views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect those of the employees of the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. This is Dan Burke saying, I'll see you at the movies.